Section 7, Chapters 20 through 23. In this section, Klee and I expand on how failure is not the end, but merely a work in progress. Klee and I both talk about failure stories, singing badly, and horses. We also talk about how it is important to be okay with making all the mistakes. We expand on lions and tigers and bears, oh my, of living uncertainty, and delve into the illusion of security. We also talk quite a bit about how worrying works against you. Okay, so let's talk about failure. 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 Yep. How failure is a work in progress. Listening to this chapter, uh, first I wanted to talk about how the fear of failure is essentially an Ouroboros of bullshit. Yeah. That basically goes like, you're afraid of failure, right? So you probably don't try to do the thing that you want to do. So then you feel like a failure anyway because you didn't try. So then you self-identify as a failure, which then perpetuates your fear of failure and your feeling that you are a failure. So then you don't try other things and then you feel worse about yourself. And that could perpetuate pretty much as long as you allow it to. Yeah. It's a horrible cycle. Yeah, it's it's hilarious to me because when you stop and you actually think about uh, the fact that you're afraid to do something because you might fail at it, but you're feeling like a failure anyway because you're not trying it, it really puts into perspective the fact that you should just go for it no matter what because if you fail, uh, you keep going or feel like a failure, but if you don't even try, you're going to feel like a failure anyway. Yeah. So just go for it. Who Absolutely. Cares? So you tell the story about riding horses, and I I love the story about riding horses. I actually have a horse riding story too, and I I love how you describe that day where you take your girlfriend out to ride these horses, and you were feeling scared and yeah. intimidated, yeah. and you were feeling yellow. And I don't know why the color yellow has been associated with cowardice. There's a whole bunch of theories going back to like ancient times why yeah. yellow is associated with cowardice. But um, you were feeling yellow that day, and as a result, watching your girlfriend get thrown off the horse just amplified your terror. It did. It totally scared me. Here's the irony of that story, and something that I don't mention in the book, is that the horses belonged to my dad. They were my horse. They were our horses. My girlfriend was just riding my dad's horses. So like my dad was the one that had the farm. It wasn't even her. Um, she had ridden horses when she was younger and, uh, apparently, uh, was way less afraid of falling off of a horse than I was. So I wanted to share my horse riding story too, because I think it's interesting because you describe fear of failure as the fear to try something for the first time, Yeah. but it can creep up on you at any time. Yeah. So my first and second experience riding horses happened within a two day period. When I was younger, I would say I was probably about eight, nine years old. I was in Girl Scouts and we got taken to like a dude ranch camp sort of thing. And one of the experiences that we got to do was riding horses. And for me, it was the first time even being in close proximity to a horse. So our first day out on the horses, basically they took us all in and they showed us the horses and they chose a horse for us and they helped us get up on these giant horses. I mean, my little clear memory of it is like I mean, these horses are giant. They're, they're giant. They're giant. Even if you're a full grown adult, like uh, the horses are not little creatures. They're they're pretty darn big. Yeah. So they help us get on these horses. And basically the thing is like we ride these horses on a trail and all the horses follow one another. And they've got this all pretty well uh, organized and pretty safe. Right. So my first day riding a horse, my horse's name was Dauber. And he was super nice and gentle, and everything went pretty well. Like, the, the horse experience was good. My second day out, Dauber wasn't available, and they put me on a horse named Cherokee. And Cherokee had an interesting temperament. Cherokee would stop along the trail to look around at stuff, I don't know, to do whatever a horse does, to, to use the uh, horse bathroom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which is everywhere which is everywhere but he would stop and then he would realize he had fallen behind and then he would gallop right. to catch up right. this was utterly 
terrifying for me. I basically spent the whole entire time out on the horse this time just terrified. And I didn't know what to do. He would stop and then he would run and then he would stop again and then he would run. So we got back and I was like entirely freaked out. Got off the horse my second time on the horse and it had like dampened the first experience for me. Oh, yeah. And so I was hence. I don't think I've gotten on a horse actually since that day. And I think it's interesting that there's a saying of getting back on the horse because it does illustrate the fear response and the uncertainty. The fear response, because if you don't get back on the horse, um, then you give into the fear. Right. And then you take away just that memory of the fear, basically. I don't like being afraid of things. And you know this about me. Mm hmm. Um, back then that wasn't the case back then. I think there was a lot more involved. I had a similar story from when I was younger, we were in Puerto Rico and we were on these trails or whatever. And it just so happened that the horse that I got was new to the pack. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it wasn't listening and paying attention. And there was one point where the horse kind of wanted to take off and almost took off with me. And luckily the person that was there caught me when I fell off of the horse And so from that point on, I remember on the ride, I didn't want to ride that horse anymore, which in my opinion, isn't necessarily a thing, you know, like a fear that you should uh, ignore, ignore, you know, like there was something the the horse was very temperamental. They were having issues with the horse. Uh, I would not suggest like, well, you know, don't be afraid. Just get back on that same horse. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm suggesting here as an illustration. What I'm suggesting is. You need to identify and make sure that the fear that you have is uh, something that is actually a detriment to you in that moment in time. I didn't fall off the horse when my girlfriend uh, fell off the horse. She did. Right. But that fear was enough. My horse was, sure, it was like trying to gallop along and stuff. And honestly, if I wasn't so uh, scared... I would have had a great time because there was nothing about that that was fearful. Now, she went a little overboard. I think that she was enjoying the fact that I was kind of afraid. And so, like, she made a dumb move by turning a corner a little bit too quickly and Mm -hmm. not not holding on enough. But really, there was nothing in that moment with those horses in that situation that caused any, like, real detrimental fear to come up. I've had situations where, like, there was a horse that I just, I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not riding it, you know, and somebody else was like, come on, why are you scared? And because they're used to breaking in horses, you right. know, wild horses, they're not scared of it because it's still not broken in. But I'm it's like, not for you. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have the skill, nor do I want to learn how to break in a horse. Thank you very much. And I think that's also a good illustration of the healthy fear response, right? Versus the irrational fear response. Yes. So was it, was it sound of sound mind for you to say, maybe I don't want to be on that horse or for me to say, little clee i don't want to get back on that horse but i would get back on a horse right uh and so you know i remember that from childhood would i get back on a horse now definitely yeah but i would exercise uh judgment yeah you you exercise caution when it's something like that we all know that uh riding a horse could be dangerous Mm -hmm. you want to push through a fear if the fear doesn't make any sense yeah. Um, even then, when it comes to horses, I don't know. I, I you know, may, maybe this is just my bias, but like, even then, I wouldn't try to push through a fear because, you know, horses sense fear. So I'm like, mm, <laughs> maybe. I just, I'd just rather not ride it if I'm afraid. Yeah, I think that's a good point, too, <laughs> using your judgment. So I think part of the thing that's tied up in the fear of failure isn't just fear of the failure itself, but it's fear of other people witnessing our failures. Right. Um, And you reference like, you know, a singer um, practicing, practicing hitting notes that maybe they can't hit. And all you can do is practice and you're going to sound horrible. I can't tell you how many times I've been trying to stretch my vocal range and it sounds bad. I mean, yeah. you've heard plenty of it. Oh, I've heard plenty of it here. My brother, you know, my brother is a singer. So like I've heard him and he's amazing. Everybody can agree that he's amazing Indeed. at what he does. But I've heard him trying to stretch his voice and, uh, you know, hit a few foul notes here and there. Uh, and and it makes sense. The the difference is like I think um, when it comes to that, he's done enough live shows where like that kind of thing doesn't worry 
him that much. He's not too worried about what the neighbors think. Right. And especially when it comes to music. I mean, music and art are very similar as far as the practitioners of music and art, right? Because you have a bunch of people that get up on stage or uh, they have their artwork up on a wall. They've got all these inner insecurities, right? And everybody responds a different way. Some people respond in a way where they are boastful and really, really hypercritical of the people around them. That way they can make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. And then some people just kind of like, you know, shy away into their own little cave. And some people just don't care. They don't care. And I think that that's where the where would what would the neighbors think thing comes in the aspect of that fear, because we're a little bit overly concerned of the interpretation of something going wrong being a failure instead of it just being a work in progress. Right. So I think it's this whole idea. There's this whole idea out there that you shouldn't put yourself out there. You shouldn't put your work out there. You shouldn't perform on stage. You shouldn't do the un, until you've mastered this thing. Right. So you're supposed to just kind of like burst onto the scene with your art perfected and like greet the world. Hello, world. I'm now ready to show off my skill set. That's what people are. A lot of people are striving for. Like, don't put your work out there until you've perfected it. Don't play the song until you could play it flawlessly through. And that's don't because a lot of people out there are under the impression that that's how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand. I, I, later on in the book, I talk about comedians, so I'll, but uh, so I'll keep it very short here. But comedians write a set or have a set in progress, and then they go up on stage in small comedy clubs and they do the set and they risk being booed off the stage, no matter how popular the comedian is, because they're not sure. They're still working through their jokes. They're trying to see where the timing is, uh, what jokes are going to stick, which ones are thrown away. They have no idea by sitting at home and practicing on their own. They only know what's going to work by putting it out there in Absolutely. front of people and working through the process and being willing to fail. Comedians are a huge inspiration for me as far as like failure is concerned because a lot of these guys really get up there and bomb horribly and they are willing to go up there then for the next set, for the next hour and do the same thing. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to me. There's this disconnect. There's this desire to present yourself to the world as like, here I am. I'm perfect. It's the same thing that drives the highlight reel on social media. Right. Um, people not wanting to show the work in progress, the practice, because I think somewhere inside of us, we're worried that some people are going to see us practicing or making a mistake and judge us based on that, that that's where we're, that's where our capability ends. Right. Not understanding that it's a work in progress. And that's the thing, like a lot of people may judge us on that. Uh, because they don't understand the process the same way as a lot of people that are trying to get it perfect don't understand the process. You know, a lot of people believe that, like, the Beatles were, uh, jumped on the scene as this year the Beatles became popular, and in actuality, the Beatles played little shithole places for a long time. For a long time. They spent, uh, just as young kids, they spent the majority of their lives practicing music and out there and played shows just about every night. Every single night they played a show for like 10 years and they became really tight when they were able to do that and write different songs and had the opportunity. You don't do the thing unless you're actually doing the thing. If you're sitting there planning for doing the thing and you're trying to perfect it before you get up there, I mean, that's an impossible thing to do. You cannot perfect anything until you actually put it out there and know what the hell you're talking about or what it is that the experience is. Yeah, definitely. Now, I'm not criticizing practicing and honing your skills at home. No. In the safety of your home, definitely. Um, but I'm of the mindset that my my work, whatever it is, jewelry, music, whatever, is never going to be perfect. It's always going to be improving. So if I was just waiting, I would never put it out there. Yeah, and that's where the whole concept of perfection comes into question. Like, what is perfect? You know, what is perfect? Are you comparing your art or something to somebody that's been putting their art out there for like 30 or 40 years and has made a successful career of it? Is that what you're comparing yourself with? Are you planning on hitting the scene that way? Uh, where like, oh, everything is perfect and everything. That's impossible. Like, you cannot do that. 
first off, that's someone else's career. So there's no way that you're going to even want to achieve that really if, unless you when you get there. And second of all, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And whatever it is that you're creating now is the perfect creation for where you're at now. And yeah, absolutely. Practice at home. A musician that goes up on stage, right? If the only time they play music is when they're on stage and they're not at home honing their skill and practicing, they're not going to improve. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with musicians that were like that and they really weren't practicing at home. And it was really just about the rush of being on stage for them. And they weren't really improving or evolving. No, as no. They, they basically become a, a one note. Uh, Pat, they don't they don't improve they don't evolve mm-hmm. they don't change they don't practice things and you have to ask yourself well, well what's the reason that you're doing that mm-hmm. you're just doing it for the rush of getting on stage it doesn't have anything to do with the music and with artists it's the same thing it's like either you are creating pieces for yourself because that's what you want to do or you're creating pieces because you want to put them out there in the world or you just want to use this medium to express yourself uh, whether it's art music writing you know most people that have published books have books upon books upon books of journals and notes and things like that they just write all the time Mm -hmm. and they put their stuff they put certain segments of that out there but like they're doing it because it is something that they they feel the need to do as an expression. If you if you're too concerned about failure, um, and you are waiting until everything is perfect, that there's a fine line between honing your skill at home mm-hmm. and waiting until it's perfect. Absolutely. I mean, so you put this book out into the world and. This book is awesome, but I doubt that you feel like this book is perfect. Oh, no. This this book is a mess. This book <laughs> is a mess. I wouldn't call it a mess. The audiobook is a mess. The audiobook recording is a mess. Anytime that I'm looking at the book or I'm looking, there are millions of ways that I could have improved this book. But it's out there now. It's alive. It has a life of its own. The The audiobook has a life of its own. It's recorded with all its twerks and mistakes and failures. I could easily look at this thing and say, like, I'm, I'm ashamed of that. But I'm not. It's the same way that I'm not ashamed of some of the goofy pictures that I started my career with. When I look back and I'm like, whoa, that's that's actually not that great <laughs> looking. Um, but I'm I'm not ashamed of those pieces. Because- I am proud to display those pieces as a part of my journey. Absolutely. And so many people are enjoying what you're putting out there versus it could still be in conceptual because you could have been in analysis paralysis. Oh, yeah, I could have. I probably could have held on to this book forever uh, and not put it out there just waiting for it to be perfect. I think that there's a general paradigm shift happening now, too, which I'm really happy and excited about, which is uh, a decade or two ago. Um, when you were looking at all the the realm of the gatekeepers, right? Yeah. The record labels, the big name movie companies, the publishing houses, the mainstream galleries, the huge mega galleries. Everything was so polished. Yeah, I mean these these places, these these organizations, these big I don't even know what to call them. They didn't put things out there that were any less than polished. Right. It's that star quality, right? It's the thing that makes us all starry-eyed to witness whatever it is. Just everything in its proper place, not a flaw in sight. And because we've shifted away from that and people are able to put their stuff out there without a record label, without a publishing house, without a big movie company, uh, without a mega gallery, you're seeing more and more of people's process rather than just the polished, finished product. You polish things as best you can. But even within those those industries, um, it is the illusion of something being polished, Mm -hmm. right? Because there is usually a big difference between what the musician or the artist or whoever it is wants versus what maybe a producer thinks is going to sell. And you see this happen with movies all the time where you get a writer and a director who write and are ready to direct something uh, that is going to be amazing. 
And then you have producers and a lot of these other people that come in and say, well, we need to put this in the movie. We need to put that in the movie. I don't really think people out there are going to like this scene. You know, they, they, they predict things based on the polishing of something based on what has come before Mm -hmm. and what kind of things are popular. And I've seen that happen with songs, too, where instead of like an artist writing a song for themselves and putting it out there, their their uh, manager or whoever it is is purchasing music. And then they're they're putting this song together. And essentially what you got is somebody who's very popular because they meet a certain criteria that uh, the producers are looking for, that record companies are looking for, and they're giving them the songs and they're basically creating... It's kind of like when you look at NSYNC and and all those like boy bands. The manufactured bands. The manufactured bands that are put out there. But then a a lot of that stuff goes unspoken. All you see is the polished end product that a bunch of people were involved in creating. And what you don't see is the, the the politics that goes on underneath. It was the same experience that my brother had going to American Idol. Mm-hmm. He's an amazing singer. Everyone can agree on that. When he got up there, um, people in the hallway were blown away when he was singing the song that he was singing. Well, they rejected him. And the reason they rejected him was because he didn't meet the demographic that, that they, they were, were looking, looking for. for. It had nothing to do with the music. Yeah. But they, um, so yeah, there's, I mean, you're talking about teams of people, each person handling one element. You're talking about focus groups and all kinds of stuff. And for the longest time, that's what was out there. That's what independent artists were comparing themselves to. Yes. So you hear a Bruno Mars song, you can't find one fault with it. Right. You know? And so us indie musicians are looking at that going, how, how? Why should I even put my stuff out there, right. my crappy songs, um, comparatively? Like, this is so above my pay grade here. Not realizing, like, you're talking about millions of dollars and teams of people to make that happen. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that either. But um, an indie artist, an independent artist of any genre, uh, comparing yourself against that. Uh, can be really daunting and discouraging. And so I'm glad that we're seeing more of indie artists well, I mean, the in thing, the process. The thing is that the truth is that like nowadays, and you're talking about back in a day where maybe 20 years ago, mm-hmm. where we just didn't have the technology. Right. Pretty much everything that a lot of these studios paid a lot of money to do, you could do at home with a, with a desktop computer. So like there's a lot of a lot of leeway and a lot of tools that have been given to creatives in order to be able to put themselves out there and circumvent a lot of these industries that their entire um, income has come from the distribution of. And in some way, instead of just being distribution companies, they eventually became managers as well because they realized that that's where the money was. So at this point, it wasn't just about a big mega gallery showing uh, the artwork to their collectors. At this point, it became a mega gallery controlling the output of what the artist puts out there. Or even with the music industry, uh, controlling the band and what output and when they're putting it out there and when they're showing their stuff. And basically managing the band's image and everything like that because it is their investment and they're going to pull as much money as they can out of it. And that's where it comes in. Like, what is the image that you're putting out there? Is it really you or do you have some manager telling you what you're supposed to be because that's what's popular? Or are you doing it to yourself because you think that you're supposed to have this certain image? And I guess that's where it comes in. I'm glad that more of the realness of people and the beginning stages of careers and the mistakes, more of that is accessible to us these days. And that's what I would say is really at the forefront of this, because I really don't think that the the whole concept of polished, first of all, is where I have an issue. Because like I could listen to Bruno Mars and probably pick out about 15 flaws in some of the songs because, you know, yes, you got these team of people and it's Bruno Mars, but really when it comes down to it, it's just a bunch of humans putting together something that sounds as great as they can make it sound Mm -hmm. because really that's what it comes down to. And as far as being an independent artist, 
you're going to want to put something out there that sounds as great as you can make it sound. And for the most part, nobody's going to hear it back. I imagine that every single musician out there that's put out a record that is just amazing to everyone listens to the record themselves and can point out 20, 30, 40 things in there that they would have done differently. Undoubtedly. You know, and so like I think that a lot of the pressure of that whole idea of something being polished right Mm -hmm. comes down to uh i've heard that used in the art world well you know the artwork looks good it's just not polished and i'm like what the fuck does that mean (laughs) what do you you know like doesn't look polished is it finished or is it not finished that's up to the artist isn't it and so like there are all these uh criteria that we wait for and that's one of those like well i gotta make sure that this is polished and you are polishing it and comparatively uh going up against a, an ideal that just doesn't actually exist out there right you think that all these records that we hear of all these songs that were produced by these big companies are perfect and polished and really they're not that their sound is great because back in the day they needed to have an entire recording studio that now fits in a laptop a lot of the stuff from back then That was an excuse for artists to be afraid of failure, afraid that they're not going to get it right and just waiting around to put their stuff out there. Um, That stuff is it's not relevant anymore. Right. And yet for a lot of us, we still have those fears because they've been spoken over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And and you think that's just how it is. And you got all these people that aren't actually in the art world telling you. Well, that's how it is because they heard it over here and over there or they heard it as they were growing up. And so like a lot of these criteria of things being perfect is what's causing a lot of people to sit on their hands and not do anything. Absolutely. It would be the thing that would keep me from uh, which we've been doing recently, which is uh, outside of the comfort zone for me is like putting some of our band practice out there. Yeah. For people to see. Yeah. They get to hear me mess up the note. They get to hear you mess up the guitar. They get to hear us forget what we were doing and start over again. Like, uh, And, you know, that fear of like, well, I don't want people to think that that's where, you know, that that's where I'm at with music. That's where I'm at with that song. Right. Um, and that that's what would stop me is like fear of being judged for a mistake. I think, though, that right now, if I were to say um, that we're moving into an era it's not an era of things being less polished because really uh, artists, uh, uh, no matter what you are, whether you're a writer or a painter or a jeweler or a musician, we are anal retentive about things sounding the way that we want them to sound. Sure. And that's or, part or, of just, you know, wanting it to be as good as we can do. Yeah. And so like, I think everything that gets put out there is polished. Even this book, as much as I look at it, I'm like, Eesh. you know, this book is very polished a lot happened in order to get this book to a place where I was comfortable putting it out there. Absolutely. And so like, but I think really what it comes down to, it's not the fact that things are more polished or or less polished now and that's acceptable. Things are more authentic because it's not record industries or galleries or whatever, putting out a persona out there of these people. It's people putting themselves out there. Right. That's exactly what I was saying is you get to see the person. You get to see the process. You get to see the evolution because we have more access to it. Right. And that's that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I agree. They're not hiding you away in some backstage area while they work on your image. Right. Whoever they are. Right. (laughs) So let's talk about making mistakes a little more because the next section in the book is make all the mistakes. Yep. And you talk about how you would rather learn from or be guided by someone who's made a lot of mistakes because you gain experiential knowledge that way. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't want somebody who like learn textbook stuff and went out there and has all these theories and how to handle this thing or that thing. Or you throw them for a loop and you ask them, well, what if this goes wrong? And they're like, well, uh, I don't know. Like I'd rather have Somebody who put themselves out there and took risks and did new things and tried to innovate because those are the people that are going to have made mistakes. Mm -hmm. The people out there that are pushing the envelope of what is possible, those are the ones that make the most mistakes. 
and of course, you know, like we hear the stories of afterwards, like, you know, well, they declare bankruptcy or they did this or they did that or this this project failed or they end up having to close this company. But then they came back. You know, we hear these stories of like people making a comeback and we admire them. But really, all that is, is somebody going out there, trying something new, taking a risk, it not working out, and then they just keep going. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's admirable. Really, all you got to do is stop stopping. I like that. Stop yeah. stopping. Yeah. Um, so I I think self-admittedly, like, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, I, especially where jewelry is concerned, especially dealing with precious metals. I get to this place where I'm like, I don't want to make any mistakes yeah. because I'm dealing with expensive metals, even though I can melt them down and try again. <laughs> like, I don't want... But honestly, like, for example, just soldering... Uh, I'm I'm getting better at soldering because I have made mistakes and I've had to like understand why the mistake happened. Yeah. Oh, well, if you just hold the flame in this one area for too long and you're just trying to force something to happen, you're going to melt some stuff. And right. that's how I learned really experientially. We talked about it a lot beforehand. Yeah. Um, but it was in the making the mistakes that I learned really how does this work? I mean, it's the same thing that I tell people because, you know, obviously right now there is so much information right at your fingertips, right? YouTube University. You mm -hmm. could go on YouTube. You could go on Skillshare. You could learn all these different things. But if you're just watching the video, you're not going to learn anything. It's not going to do much for you. You, you got to do it. You have to actually put yourself in there and be willing to make that mistake. I've seen people that are like, yeah, you know, I'm just doing all this research and watching all these videos. And there are certain things that like, you know, like when I was fixing the car engine, I watched several videos to make sure that they, there was something that they agreed on whatever it was that they were doing. Cause it was very specific. Mm -hmm. There's one way to get this engine fixed. But when it comes to something as subjective as art and you're learning a process, Really, if you want to watch a couple of videos just to compare them, that's great. But if you need to watch a whole bunch of videos because I, I need to get this down before I do it, then all you're doing is stalling. Oh, I agree. Uh, I So I love research. I very much enjoy research. I like the whole experience. I like learning in that way. I like seeing how other people do things. I like getting their take on it. Um, but there comes a point, I think, with all of us, where you know, like, the next step is to try it. Yeah. And that's where you could either go for it and risk making mistakes, or you keep yourself in a holding pattern of yeah. research. where you go into analysis paralysis, where you're just analyzing and going into research for no other reason than you're stalling. Absolutely. The fact of the matter is, humans make mistakes. Like, we make mistakes all the time. You go over several things that you could have considered mistakes. I've made tons of mistakes, if you want to call them mistakes. They've all been learning experiences. And humans are the only creature that we know of that, like, punishes ourselves indefinitely for right. making mistakes. There is that possibility. Like, there are people that will think about something that they did. I made a mistake 10 years ago, and they're still thinking about it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, did you learn from the mistake? Did you move on? Because there's no reason that you should be just sitting there pondering this thing and taking up precious brain energy imagining this mistake that you made 10 years ago. And I think a lot of times we put a lot of importance behind a mistake. Um, but you're right. We, this painting, I'm working on a portrait right now. I've made mistake after mistake after mistake. And I tell people all the time that when you're working on a portrait, chances are you're basically doing a series of micro mistakes and just tweaking them as you go. Mm -hmm. Micro mistake, tweaking, micro mistake, tweaking. We make a billion micro mistakes every day. If you've ever stubbed your toe, you made a micro mistake. You know, like it's just we do these things and we either learn from them or we go into a pattern of insanity where we're not thinking about it and we just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that pattern of repeating things over and over and over is because we're more concerned with avoiding making a new mistake than we are of learning from our old ones. I think you're probably right. And I think it, that's a mistake <laughs> because uh, there's always gold there yeah. in the mistake. If you're looking at it as a learning experience, there's always something there. 
right. to, to glean from it. Yeah, even if it is when you walk down this hallway, keep an eye out for, you know, that ledge so you don't stub your toe again. Your pinky toe will thank you. Yes. All right, let's talk about lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. And what we're really talking about is uncertainty. Yes. The illusion of stability versus uncertainty. The illusion of the stable career, which you bought into for a little over a decade. Yes. And uh, the illusion of security there and how you hated it. But at the same time, uh, it was safe it, and it was easy to stay. It was safe and it was part of the the image of what it was that was supposed to make me happy. Right. The white picket fence. The 2.5 kids. The 2.5 kids. The two cars. The good job. The I am... Uh, financially stable and I am a good husband and I am good this and good that and what it there is a lot that was built up as a facade versus what was actually going on there emotionally right so like on paper and on the surface it looked really good but underneath it all um, the, there's a lot of uh, emotional struggle within that I wanted to live a much more creative life and I was not allowing myself to, nor were the circumstances good for that. Right. But so you were thinking about security. Essentially, you were prioritizing security, not just for yourself, but for your family. Yeah, absolutely. Over personal freedom. Which, and the thing is that like... um I don't want to make it seem like I, you know, that I hated my family or anything like that because I absolutely adored my family. The problem was it's the same thing that comes back down to the the two paths, right? Mm -hmm. So like this or that, yeah, this or that. I loved uh, hanging out with my kids and doing creative projects with my kids and things like that, and like uh, filming uh, little movies and. Uh, doing art projects and different things like that. A lot of enjoyment came from that. But because I was so concerned about losing the security, which really involved uh, making sure that I did not lose my job, I poured myself way too much into my job. And at the time, the, the person that I was married to, uh, she kind of reinforced that. That's the thing you do. That's the thing that you do. I started to really pour a lot more energy, a lot more time into uh, the job that I had that I didn't really enjoy and less time doing the creative projects and putting myself, you know, I didn't even attempt to put myself out there in a creative way. Um, and that was because there was a lot of obligation there to do it that way. The irony is that I could have done it both. And it's not my kids weren't going to fight me on putting myself out there as an artist. If anything, my kids have always been really, really into the art and the movies and having fun and doing that stuff. But eventually I became a, a human being who was just miserable all the time because I was spending 80 hours a week at work because my number one goal was to make sure that the financial security blanket that I had did not go away. And then come to find out there was no real security there. No, there was no real security. One of the companies that I worked with uh, went bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. it, pretty much two weeks after they had a big meeting and said, uh, we're not going bankrupt. I kind of, it smelled fishy to me. So I had already started looking for another job. Uh, the other job that I had, basically, when my grandfather got sick, I took a leave of absence and my manager got upset with me because I just taken an impromptu leave of absence for a week because my grandfather was in the hospital. And uh, I was a little bit upset because of my job. I wasn't able to say goodbye to my grandfather. My grandfather passed away before I got to the hospital. He did not like that. And so when I came back, I had been terminated uh, without possible rehire. Then there was another job that I started that after a year of being there, because I didn't take uh, people, uh, the, the clients out to a strip club because I just didn't want to go to a strip club, do whatever it is that dudes do in there when they're hanging out together. Um, I ended up getting fired from there, too. So, like, 
all these places that I was so concerned about getting terminated from, basically none of it was under my control. There was no security there whatsoever. My entire uh, ability to be financially stable was in someone else's hands. Right. So on paper, it seems secure and it seems safe. And it also seems easy. In my mind, for most of my life working for someone else, it was just easier to be told what to do, Yeah, which I don't want to get too deep into because we have talked about this and we'll talk more about this, but it's the whole trusting yourself to make judgment calls. I was lacking in I that think, department. I think, I think we all are. And I'm not criticizing every single job out there. Obviously, there's a lot of jobs that we enjoy. Uh, a lot of my jobs I enjoyed. It was just the fact that I turned it into this other thing of obligation because right. I was too worried about losing my job. And I think that for a lot of people, that's where a lot of the stress comes from because you're more concerned about losing their, your job than you are about living life the way that you want to live your life. Mm -hmm. Because really... If you're taking your job home with you and you don't want to, then you got to ask yourself, like, why am I making this commitment to something that really is not paying me to take my work home? Absolutely. And so, like, what I realized was uh, I honestly was so afraid of doing something creative and being the one that would be responsible, essentially. It was yeah. easier to have someone else be responsible if I did get fired, the company went bankrupt, the company closed down, uh, all these situations that have happened to me with uh, business, because then there was another business that basically three weeks after I got hired, the entire company just closed down. Ah, uh, yes, I know which company you yeah. refer to. So like there's a freedom in the fact that like, oh, well, it's not my fault. Yeah. When you are your own boss, everything is in your hands. Yes. The buck stops with you. Um, I I was I thought I was much better at being told what to do, even in creative areas. Yeah, I was always kind of like a team member, even in um, set design and whatever other creative things I was doing in music. I was I was a member of a team, and it was more comfortable for me to be told this is what we're doing. And then of course. I would uh, balk at that because really I didn't want to be told what to do. So I would rebel in my own small ways, musically and artistically, but afraid to take that leap. Right. Afraid for it all to be on my plate. When you decide to do that, even if, let's say, you keep your normal job right. and you decide to do that, it's still all in your hands. Yeah. Like I said before, it was all about the two paths. You know, this or I, that. Yeah, this or that. So I was... I'm going to either jump in with both feet into my corporate job or I am going to jump in with both feet into this completely unknown thing that I have no idea how to even get started or off the ground of being an artist. And so like instead of taking the opportunity of like, hey, I was making bank. I could have I could have definitely and I didn't have to work 80 hours a week. I could have worked my 40 hours a week and then dedicated other time to my kids and my art. I could have easily done that, but instead I was so busy trying to make sure that I wasn't going to get fired that uh, I made a lot of choices where I compromised myself and my family for my job, thinking that I was doing it for my family. Absolutely. I have a question for you. Do you think any part of you threw yourself into your work that much also because you weren't doing art? So it was easier to say like, well, I don't have time for art because I'm working 80 hours a week. And that was your justification Absolutely. for being afraid to do art. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I found myself doing that too. Yeah, I used that as an excuse. Uh, definitely. And at the time, uh, I bought into it. Well, I'm just too busy all the time. It's the reason that I don't do art or I don't do this. I had a friend that was a manager uh, of one of the businesses, the same as me. And he had a full art career going. As well as being a manager. As well as being a manager. So, like, could it be done? Of course it can. Um, I just, uh, I was too chicken shit at the time to be able to uh, really make my job a secondary thing and make my art career the primary thing. Absolutely. Launching something, like an art career or anything, it, it takes a lot of emotional and mental focus yeah so you definitely have to get yourself to a place or try to get yourself to a place where you could just take the first step yeah 
the reason you call this chapter lions and tigers and bears oh my i think well it's a perfect illustration of the uncertainty factor but you talk about our ancestors and their biological fear responses yeah and how those you know because we're not hunter gatherers for the most part anymore <laughs> um we don't have to worry about tigers out on the savanna I mean, in most cases, right? Um, this, at least in our first world problems situation that exactly. a lot of us are in, those have translated into our modern day fear responses where the new survival things are money. Well, money, basically, and how money translates into shelter, security, food, clothing, caring for your family. It's all the same stuff. It's just different different representations of it a lot of people uh assume that you go into fight or flight when something physically uh happens right which you do yeah you go into fight or flight but what they don't understand is that you can go into fight or flight just worrying about bills oh totally documentation or statistics will show that just getting pulled over you immediately go into fight or flight every time. And that's why you get nervous or, you know, it, when you're going in for an interview, you go into fight or flight. When there is something that you have made much bigger than what it actually is in your mind, where it's actually not a life and death situation, but somewhere in you, you feel like it's a life and death situation, mm -hmm. you immediately go into fight or flight. I, I have, ex I'm hyper aware of when I do this uh, because I have done this uh, many times. I could just be sitting here and go into fight or flight mode and not even realize that I'm thinking about what it is that I'm thinking about. Yeah. And the problem is that when you go into fight or flight mode, your front or your frontal lobe is done. So you're dumb mm -hmm. and your butthole puckers up. Not good. It's not good it's for not your good body. It's not good for your digestive system. It's not good for anything in your body. Not your brain, not your emotions, not anything. And I know that a lot of studies have been conducted on this, and I won't cite any specific examples, but what, what we have found really overall is that humans spend a lot of time yeah. in fight or flight mode, and our brains spend a lot of time in, uh, I think, what they called beta state. Yep. which is like the fight or flight response. And it's just so bad for us. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons that I say like worrying is not a good, it's sitting there and worrying about anything that, that people worry about in their art career or in whatever it is, worrying about money. It's not going to help you. There is nothing about worry that is actually productive. It's not like you could worry yourself out of a situation. You can't. There is absolutely nothing productive about worry. And so like when you do find yourself in a position of worry, do whatever it takes to get yourself out of worry and into empowerment, even if it means getting pissed off at the fact that you're worried. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little more about that in the next section. But um, before we do that, I just wanted to talk very briefly about your ultimately your decision to shun false security and do this thing go out on the road and pursue an art career and how uh, most people thought you were nuts. And then you met me and I made the decision to do the same. Yeah. And most people thought I was nuts. And together we were just completely nuts, two crazy people doing this thing. And um, how you did, you sat with me and you said, there's no security here. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is a decision that you need to make for yourself. Yeah. I, I knew that, um, the reason that I was going out on the road, when I looked back at my life, I realized that like that life that I lived where I was very, very unhappy, always stressed out, uh, losing my hair, uh, not feeling good um, and drinking way too much, that I had created that life based on the things that I had believed and the things that I was afraid of and the things that I was consistently worried about. And so for me, because, uh, you know, I'm all or nothing mm -hmm. um, and I self-identify with that. So it must be true. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm being I, it's sar sarcastic there. But like that's that's how it's always been easier for me is to really, really face the situation and face the issue head on. And so knowing that I knew that I needed to prove to myself that I was capable because a lot of those insecurities came from a place that told me that I wasn't. 
And so going on this trip was terrifying, mm-hmm. but there was a reason why I was stepping out of the boundaries of the way that society likes to state that security is and actually put myself in a situation where I'd be able to face some of the fears that I had head on. Nothing too, you know, it wasn't like I was going into the the lion's den and was about to stick my head in a lion's mouth. There were still things like um, common sense, safety and security that were going to be there, things that I had control over. But essentially, uh, going out into the world and facing the things that I didn't have control over and realizing like, you know what, I could cross this bridge when I get to it, I could face this thing. So I knew that I was about to head out into this thing that could possibly really, really push at my uh, insecurity comfort zones. And then you were heading out there. Absolutely. And I was like, okay, well, listen, (laughs) this has to because it could end really, really badly if you are doing this thing, expecting one thing and thinking that it's about me, I don't want a sidekick. Yeah. Now an interesting thing happened with me because at that time I felt so split and I don't even think I realized how much because I did want security and safety, or at least I thought I did. My actions would say that I did. I wanted security and safety. I craved it, a feeling of stability. And at the same time, I was rebelling so hard against it. I wanted freedom. Right. I wanted adventure. I wanted to take risks. And at that time, I had taken some risks to the chagrin of my family. I had gone on a self-funded tour with my band. I had done various things. And I had had a taste of adventure. And I wanted more of it. But I quickly discovered that while I was doing it for me, I also did try to bring that false sense of security with us on the road. I tried to make you the leader. I tried to set it up in such a way where I felt safe and I still felt like the brunt of the responsibility was in your hands. So that was a learning experience also. You're just a human and I'm just a human. And the real control is in your choices that you make, your your responses to situations, which we'll touch more on in a minute also. You could try and control your surroundings and your situation and your circumstance. Try to take preventative measures in order to make sure that this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. And so like you spend all your time and energy uh, trying to prevent things. Mm -hmm. But then when they happen, you don't know how to face them. And really ultimately, the real sense of control, real genuine control, not this false sense of control of preventing this or preventing that or making sure that this happens in the future is when the shit hits the fan, how do I deal with it? That is real control. That is where the real control is, and worrying makes you dumb. Yes. And yes it and, does. and hey, look at that. That's the next section that we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> worrying makes you dumb. I um have identified in the past as an expert worrier. Yeah. Um I whether I picked it up from family or wherever I got it from, I could worry with the best of them. Right. And everything around me seemed to reinforce the idea that worrying is the thing to do uh when you're faced with tough situations or even when you think you may perhaps be faced with tough situations. I think think because worrying is the common response to uh, a possible tough situation or something happening um, in the movies, right? Yes. So, like, something's going, oh, no, oh, oh, this, everything's going to end. I don't know, man. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then you have the one person that is like, get get a hold of yourself. Let's (laughs) da-da-da-da-da, right? Because you need that dramatic introduction in there Mm -hmm. nobody wants to be the guy that worries no but we kind of all grew up learning that that's the behavior that you take on when something is happening because if you're not talking about i feel like we worry for other people's benefits right so that people know like yeah you know i'm really worried about that possibly And, and i think that that's where that habit just kind of became a thing where um you just got used to responding to things that way because you want everybody else to know that, like, listen, I'm really, really deeply thinking about this thing. And because I, I'm an I'm, adult. I, because I'm an adult and I, I have concerns. I have actually had friends and family, I think you have too, get 
vocally upset with me that I was not worried about something. Oh, yeah. I've yeah. had people say, well, why aren't you worried about that? You should be. Yeah. You should absolutely be worried. And that was at a time in my life where I was, well, I had just met you and I was beginning to understand that worrying had actually legitimately never helped me solve anything. Right. And what was I doing to myself? Because uh, I don't make good decisions when I'm worried or stressed out. Now it's the exact opposite. I'm not making this decision while I'm worried or stressed out. I'm going to wait till I'm not. Uh, you're not going to come up with any solutions that actually work. No, it makes you, it makes you dumb, as you say. It shuts yeah. down the parts of your thinking that are actually effective at problem solving. Yes. That's the irony of it. People's reaction, the thing that we're used to in society is when some shit hits the fan, it's time to, well, we better, you know, that's going to be, that's when it's time to worry. Right. And I'm like, no, it's never time to worry. Don't sit there and worry about anything. Figure out a solution to it. Change direction. Do something new. Whatever it is, change your perspective if you have to. But just don't sit there and worry because that is completely a waste of time. This is where I took a leaf from astronauts and I really admire astronauts because astronauts prepare. Right. They prepare for every eventuality that they can think of that might happen, right? Because space, it'll kill you. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Um, you're out in a vacuum away from help. But they also train not to react in a fight or flight way. They train not to dwell on the problem. They train not to worry. They train to respond in the most effective manner that they can. They train to stay calm. Yeah, exactly. They, can you imagine a bunch astronauts, of astronauts out in space like, oh, we're so worried about what's going <laughs> to happen. Like, they're not going to, what, it would be a, a shit show in space. If they were all just freaking out up there yeah, in just zero freaking G. freaking out in zero G, like... <laughs> No, yeah, and it's funny because we look at stuff like that and we admire that. We don't realize, like, these are people that trained to do that. That means anybody could train to do that. Right. Right, and they're in dire situations. Right, like, dude they saves his crew with a ballpoint pen, but I'm sitting here like, how am I going to get this phone bill paid? Yeah, exactly, and it's ridiculous to me because, like, then the people get stuck in that worry, and they sit there, and they worry, and obviously, when you sit there and you start to ruminate on your worry, that that's why you got people out there that are conspiracy theorists, uh, finding excuses for blaming this person or that person, because you spend a lot of time in your brain uh, not using the parts of your brain that are actually doing the critical thinking and you get used to living there and then you become one of these people that just doesn't think. They just spend all their time sitting there coming up with... Uh, regurgitating. Yeah, uh, regurgitating garbage that they heard from someone else. So I decided to flip the tables on my worry and actually use worry to my advantage because I wasn't in a place where I could just entirely rid myself of the worry. Right. But I thought, well, I'm pretty worried about my health. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm pretty worried about my health, but health is a concern for me. I'd like to keep myself healthy. Right. So I thought, let me use this to my advantage because I know how much havoc stress wreaks on the body uh, when you go into fight or flight or when you're constantly worried. So let me just use that little snippet of worry to my advantage and make the decision that I'm not going to do this to myself if I can help it. Right. Because because I don't like what it's doing to me physically and right. emotionally. Right. Uh, so that was a an interim strategy while I worked on the um, the emotional things that are tied up in worry. So I come back around to your real control is in how you respond. Yeah. That's where your control is. And I've thought a lot about this because we do all kinds of stuff when we feel out of control. Yeah. When we feel like we need to gain control. There's a lot of stuff we do that. There's a lot of stuff I've done that I feel is not healthy and not the best strategy. Uh, if you're going to be an artist, you're heading out into a career, A, that is not considered normal. There are no real standards for it. Uh, it is a career that is going to be completely based on your personality, on what you create, and how you want to put yourself out there, and what your idea of success is, and how that's going to evolve over time. And so like you're dealing with a complete unknown and you're going to be dealing with money issues. You're going to be dealing with all these 
things that are going to come up, insecurities about whether or not you're doing a good job, whether or not you should keep going, whether or not you should be doing all these things. And if you sit there and you start to worry about these things, then you are going to be at a standstill because worrying does not get you anywhere. It is critical thinking. It is creative thinking. It is innovative thinking. It is changing your perspective, not being in a place where you're just regurgitating some bullshit uh, that you learn to worry. You watch people around you worry about not having enough money. And so we take that on as, as a response to certain situations when in actuality, it's a complete waste of time. Absolutely. If you were out in the wild, right? Let's think about this, right? Even Because a lot of people, well, it, it comes from back in the day. No. If you were out in the wild and you were out in the middle of a field, right? Mm -hmm. And you were worried that there was a lion in the bushes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure, you're going to be hyper aware. But at that point, you have to make a decision, you cannot be stuck in worry. If you're stuck in worry, basically your frontal lobe immediately shuts down. Why? Because you need all your resources to go into your muscles so that you can run and get out of there. So the moment that is the way that we use worry in a productive way. If you're worried about something, you have an immediate response to it and you run physically. You run, you do something, you get out of there, you fight, whatever the situation is. If you are just sitting there in a constant place of worry. Then it, essentially you're just standing there with tunnel vision. Exactly. You're standing there with tunnel vision. You get frozen in fear and the lion pops out. And guess what? You run into a tree and get yeah, eaten. It's a complete waste of time. Mm -hmm. Just sit there and perpetually be in a state of worry. A real sense of security set in for me in understanding that all of this could be taken away. I could lose everything. Yeah. And I started with nothing. I didn't have any of the things that we now have. The tools, the materials, the studio. Uh, what I did have was myself. And the sense of security was, I can't control whether I lose everything. I would like not to. But I am getting to a place where I trust in myself. Well, I would still be here. Yeah. And I think that's parallel to an ex the experience that you had where you, you did lose everything I did. and you realized, I, I'm still here. I lost everything and I realized that I was still here. And basically, it's one of the reasons that I could look around and say, listen, if we lose all of this, right, I don't want to. But if we lose all of this uh, and I'm still here, we're still here. Then we'll make a go of it. We, we started this with nothing. What ended up happening to me when I had my corporate job and the reason that I became so like jumped into that full full on and so worried about losing my job was because I had all these things that I thought were directly attached to losing my job. The irony is that I, you know, I, I lost one job. One of them went bankrupt and I just went to go work somewhere else. So like, obviously I didn't lose the things at the time. Uh, when I lost one job. So like that was a complete falsity. But either way, like there I was dedicating all this time because I was so worried about losing all these things that I had amassed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at that and look at and look at the state that I was in during that time where I wasn't fully enjoying the job that I had, I wasn't fully enjoying being a creative. I wasn't fully enjoying the my my house and the things that I had, I wasn't enjoying those things because I was too busy being worried about losing them. So when I look at that, I look at this right now. And if I allowed myself to get into a state where I'd be worried about losing the studio, then it all become about the financial needing these financial things to happen in order to keep things going. And then spending all my time being worried that I'm going to lose the studio if I don't fulfill those things and trying to do essentially live my life in a state of preventative maintenance, which is squandering what you have. Exactly. Art rhymes with fart. Just saying. <laughs> Let's talk real quick about the pattern interrupt because you've thrown them at me several times when I'm downward spiraling oh, into yeah. a worry state. Oh yeah. So art rhymes with fart. Uh, yeah. Total pattern interrupt. 
Basically, the way that a pattern interrupt works is, uh, and maybe everybody at home could try this just just for fun, because I always love trying this just for fun. So the next time you're in a situation where you're like talking to Uncle Gerald or somebody who's like just like ma 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 talking about something that you're like, I really don't care. I don't want to deal with this anymore or whatever. Just kind of like look straight into their eyes, pause, uh, have a sense of alert to your body language look at them and be like wait a second is that is that my car alarm going off and then just pause then look right back at them and say okay i'm sorry yeah continue your story and watch as maybe for a moment they have to rethink and see if they could find their footing because they totally forgot where they were that is called a pattern interrupt. At the most extreme, they're completely derailed from their tangent. Yep. Uh, or at least it's lost some emotional steam. So they're not as worked up, perhaps. Yep. Or you, you could do it to yourself. And it could be car alarm or it could be totally absurd. Yep. What is that blue thing doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Now, now when, the- you're, when you're doing a pattern interrupt for yourself, obviously, it's just taking yourself out of whatever pattern it is. So you know that when you are downward spiraling, chances are your body language is going to be a certain way. Chances are you sit there and you look down to the left and you do all these things. And you don't move very much like there's going to be a pattern to the way that you behave when you are downward spiraling or depressed. And essentially what you want to do is a pattern interrupt is doing not that. Right. Doing the opposite of that. If you're sitting down, stand up. If you're looking down to the left and that's what you do, then look up and to the right. Uh, If you just stay still and you sit there and you contemplate, don't. Move around, dance, do whatever it takes. Uh, And essentially what you do in that moment, if you're used to if you're used to sitting inside and uh, just being alone, don't go outside and socialize, do whatever it is that is the opposite of that pattern that you have. And essentially what that does is it breaks the pattern. And the more times that you break a pattern, the less consistent that pattern becomes. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to really depressing music, perhaps try putting on something a little more upbeat. I think it's hilarious because a lot of us, when we get sad, we just put on depressing music and just sit there. I was notorious for doing that. (laughs) And it definitely didn't help me to feel better. The music was beautiful and lovely. Of course. But a musical pattern interrupt has often served my purposes as well. Yeah. And with that, we will conclude this section. Sweet. And on to the next few chapters we go. And that concludes this section of the audiobook. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. If you would like, you can proceed to the next section. Have an awesome day. Adios!